Hey fam. So I am finally recording this, um, the house of the force of Lebanon, um, God's camp video. I have been researching this for a couple months and, um, this is just the coolest. Um, it's just a really neat project. I hope you like it. After I had the dream of the angel coming to our house and picking us up and taking us to a camp and I was kind of doubtful like well I don't know I might need this and I might need that and then he showed us this place and I was like oh I guess we don't really need anything. Um, and that if you haven't seen it is in a video called six dreams equals soon video and it's like the last um, part of that is the story of this dream. So after I did that video. Um, all of a sudden my feed was just filled with different people's stories that um, are dreams where they had been to places that they were either camping or they had um, gone to a cabin or they had some sort of situation where they were in like a preparation um, with other Christians but like after um, rapture and I was like okay what are you trying to tell me God because this is like repeating so then um, I had some people say to me, hey, I feel like I've been to the place where you've been. I mean, I had several people say that to me, like, oh, I feel like I've been to this place or I had a dream similar to that or, you know, something. So I was like, well, only God can do this. Like, this is a very um, brought together, like, 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 I need to really think about this and maybe, maybe look into this a little deeper. So I was um, studying up and I was kind of assembling a timeline um, on a totally different project and I was um I just happened to happen to <laughs> I just happened to um come upon Solomon's house of the forest of Lebanon now as I read it um it was really a small set of verses but when I read those verses it just jumped out at me and it was screaming at me and I was like I gotta dig into this so when I read the description, I was like, this is describing the safe house. This is describing the place where the angel took me. Like, I didn't say all the details in my dream retell um, because I didn't realize they were going to be important. But like in House of the Forest of Lebanon, they are square windows. Well, they were square windows in my dream. I just couldn't find pictures like that. So, you know, I just moved around it, you know. So I want you to understand that as I'm studying this I always have a double understanding after we're raptured there might be um, a real place where we go and we are trained for war because you know we're going to come back at the end and fight against team satan right or this could be a metaphorical like we are in the spiritual wilderness because we are not in our home here on this earth I just always keep that in mind that this could go either way. I'm not specifically saying this has to be a physical place and I'm not saying this has to be metaphorical. Um, so either way you look at it, metaphor, reality, doesn't matter. It's going to be showing, this study shows the true provisions and some really fascinating stuff of how the Lord protects his own, of how the Lord views us. And I think, I think you're really going to be blessed by this. Here's the Hebrew meaning of all the words in this little phrase of the house of the forest of Lebanon. Okay. So we have first the house. House is Bayat. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of a Bayat box. It's worn by the ultra-Orthodox Jews. Um, and it holds um, four, three or four different scriptures. And um, this is considered very holy. They, they wrap this and the box sits on their skin, um, some on their head, some on their, their arm. And um, they feel in times of prayer that they need to have these um, verses nearest their body um, in their processes, okay? So, bayit just means house. It's the box that all those verses go in. So, bayit means house. And um, so, when I looked into this, into the Hebrew, it was actually really neat because it doesn't only just mean a house. It means a family house. And it's often referred to as a tent that is movable. And I was like, a tent? <laughs> so now here we are on um, camping, tents, cabins. It, it's going to keep recurring. Watch. Okay. Then we've got the forest, which is Yar. Um, the forest just means the woods, the wilderness, um, the wooded heights or mountains. 
But then I found this this um, Jewish meaning that means colloquially um, the honey in the combs, and it means the means the finest honey that is in the core of like if you took off the dirty outside edges of the honeycomb and then you get all the way into the center that is like considered the most pure honey and that's what it means it's this honey in the combs the the pure most protected honey so um that reminded me very much of genesis forty three eleven, um when they talk about taking the best fruits of the land because it talks about the honey is in that list. So then we have um, Lebanon, okay? Lebanon just means Lebanon, and it means whiteness. This is because it represents the wooded mountain range in the Eastern Ridge Mountains that are north of Israel and south of eastern Lebanon that is often partially covered with snow for most of the year. Um, the Lebanon cedar grows there, and they that cedar tree has white wood as well. So whiteness is referring to snow, but all of us, I think, generally Christians think of whiteness as purity, right? So if you think of it as the hotel, um, the family home or tent, uh, the honey in the combs in the whiteness, the purity, okay? So let's read through, let's read about this place real quick. Um, it's most um, direct uh, place. First Kings is, is where it is all laid out. It's also repeated in Second Chronicles. There's other verses that come up, but this is the big retelling. So First Kings 7, one. But Solomon took 13 years to build his own house, so he finished all his house. He also built the house of the forest of Lebanon. Its length was 100 cubits, its width was 50 cubits, and its height was 30 cubits, and four rows of cedar pillars and cedar beams on the pillars. It was paneled with cedar above the beams that were on 45 pillars, 15 to a row. There were windows with beveled frames in three rows and window was opposite window in three tiers. All the doorways and the door posts had rectangular frames and the window was opposite window in three tiers. He also made the hall of pillars. Its length was 50 cubits and its width was 30 cubits and in front of them was a portico with pillars and a canopy was in front of them. First Kings ten seventeen. And Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. Six shekels of gold went into each shield. He also made 300 shields of hammered gold and three minas of gold went into each shield. The king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. And then First Kings ten twenty one. All of Solomon's drinking vessels were gold and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Not one was silver, for this was accounted as nothing in the days of Solomon. Okay, so let's blow through the dimensions and, and the basics of the structure of the house before we get into the application. So as you can see, um, that the house of the forest of Lebanon and Noah's ark are the same width. They are actually also the same height. Um, although Noah's ark is significantly longer than the house itself. Um, both Solomon's temple and the temple that traveled with the Israelites are much smaller, but all but the tent were at the same height. I converted the cubits to feet since it is more relatable. So 51 feet is the height, which in our terms is about four stories high. Um, to put this in perspective, the House of the Forest of Lebanon and the White House are very similar in dimensions. Um, you can see here that the White House is only about nine feet taller and the length is really, really close to the same. So I know when I first Googled the House of the Forest of Lebanon, I found a map of um, the holy city of Jerusalem and where the temple, where people thought the temple was in different buildings. Um, however, it has this a map like this. So here are all of Solomon's buildings. And of course they put the house of the forest of Lebanon right in this area. But when I was reading it, I didn't feel that way. So I kept digging and I did find three men in extra biblical literature um, that refer to this very building in Lebanon in the woods. Now consider these historical references and consider how rare a building of more than half the size of the ark would have been to find in these times, especially with these exact dimensions. 
So here's Gabriel Sionist. He wrote of a tower in the woods of Lebanon that was 170 feet by 50 feet. This was referenced in a book from the 1500s, but they did not say when Gabriel lived. Then there was Benjamin of Tudalia. He was a medieval Jewish um, traveler from the 12th century. He wrote of footing stones for a building in the forests of Lebanon that were six feet long and three feet wide. This is easily believable since a cedar tree of Lebanon can be over a hundred feet wide. So pillars made for them would be cut down into various wide widths to hold a house that is four stories high. Then there was Mundrell, another author found in a book written in the 1500s. Without, so he wrote that he saw the ruins of the House of the Forest of Lebanon from abroad. So hopefully you can agree with me that this is a very separate house away from Jerusalem, built in the mountains near Lebanon. Now we did live in the mountains for eight years. And um, so when I connected the dots on this house, to me, in order to have this house and its footings and everything in the mountains, I visually saw it cut into the mountain. So first, the foundation was almost assuredly cut into the mountain because that is how most of the houses are in the mountains. Um, consider how this home here is cut into the mountain. It makes for a sure foundation. The mountain itself is the rock. And this is my mock-up of the House of the Forest of Lebanon cut into the mountain. Notice the yellow here is where the house is securely leveled into the mountain. Then the foundation pillars would be spread out evenly under the soil in links that keep the house level. To me, the symbolism in the house cannot be overlooked and is highly relatable to the Christian. So the house being laid into the mountain or on the cornerstone reminds me, of course, of the 1 Peter 2, 6, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will be will by no means be put to shame. Christ is our cornerstone, just as the mountain is this house's cornerstone. Next, the text references that the foundation pillars were cedars of Lebanon. This is from the woods that we in America could most understand as the giant redwoods in California. But they are bigger and taller, and they the wood is white and knotless. And it's a very hard, um, sturdy wood that repels pests and termites, assuring a long life for the foundation. This wood was also used in purification sacrifices back in the Levitical law um, when that was in force. And you can read about that in Leviticus 14 or Numbers 19. It says the pillars were in four rows, but it does not say how many pillars. I instantly thought of Ephesians 2, 19, 20, 19 to 20, where it says, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the numbers of the members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together, growing into a holy temple in the Lord. In whole, you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. So I listed out the apostles and the major and minor prophets, and that total came up to 28. That was a number easily divisible by four. So I figured, all right, let's go with that. So the 12 apostles, of course, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James, Thaddeus, Simon, and Matthias, who replaced Judas. And then the four major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, the 12 minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Mahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So this giant tree that repels pests, that is that are the foundation, these giant tree chunks, let's call them, um, these would be likened to the giants of the faith for us. Very strong and very reliable. In the text, it says that the beams lay upon the pillars. Well, if there were four rows of pillars and the cedars of Lebanon are wider than most residential homes are in America, then these beams could be as thick and as wide as was practical to provide a sturdy foundation to hold a four-story high building. That made me think of the four elements in the last book of Romans that referenced how Christ is able to establish us. 
So Romans 16, 25 to 6. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest by the prof- by the prophetic scriptures, made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God for the obedience to the faith. The four elements are, one, the preaching of Jesus Christ. Two, the revelations of the mystery of the church. Three, the prophetic scriptures. And four, the commandments of the everlasting God. These four beams, if you will call them that with me, um, will couple together with the foundational pillars of the apostles and the prophets to create the entire foundation for Christianity. Now the whole house or the body of Christ that metaphorically resides in the house is only able to exist because of these foundational strengths and capable to hold the house securely. The next thing that was important to mention in the text was that there are 45 pillars in rows of 15. So that means three rows since three times 15 is 45. Now let's look at the indoor pillars. They are also the same pure white Lebanon cedar. I had to think a bit since 15 and three or 45 are not really popular Bible numbers like seven or 12, you know? So here's a few things that might be taken into consideration when musing about these numbers. 15 equals the feast day of the Passover holiday, Nisan 15. 15 is the day of the full moon of each month if counted in the biblical manner. 15, there are 15 Psalms of Ascent between Psalm 120 and 134 that were historically sung by the Jewish travelers on their pilgrimages each time they went three times a year to the required festivals to Jerusalem. Uh, 15, there were 15 steps to enter the temple. 15, Hosea redeemed his wife for 15 shekels. 15, Shushan Purim is on the 15th of Adar. Now, when looking up the Hebrew meaning of the elects involved here and some interesting finds, I used three times 15 equals 45, these numbers, anything that would match. So three is the number of grace and the number of generations for the sin cycle, prayer, prosperity, pride, partying, prisoners, every three generations throughout the Old Testament. And, you know, to be honest, we're really not that much different. 15 implies salvation, healing, redemption, stepping up, ascending, and fullness of light to the Jews. 15 is also the number that represents the bond of God in holy matrimony to the Jews. Now, also, there are 42 generations from Abraham to Jesus as listed in Matthew. And then if we add three for grace, that would be 45. (laughs) When considering that the foundation pillars are symbolic with men of the Bible that were strong in the faith and found worthy to be listed um, as our foundations, I wondered if Hebrews chapter 11, which discussed our great cloud of witnesses, had 45 people mentioned. Well, it did not. But, of course, it did list quite a lot of people with great faith. And it states at the end that time would fail to list all of the faithful. So I compiled the list of all of those references and those alluded to and subtracted any out that were already in the exterior foundation. Then I added other Bible characters that I know showed great faith until I hit the number 45. Now, of course, these are symbolic. It it is by God's inspiration that I've chosen these 45, but you could choose any 45 out of the Bible probably that showed great faith. So here's a quick run through of the list. 15 patriarchs and Old Testament men, Noah, Moses, Joseph, Jacob, Joshua, Caleb, Lot, Abraham, Enoch, Job, Abel, Isaac, Abel, Isaac, David, Gideon, Samuel, 15 Old Testament men and women, Elisha, Elijah, Samson, Hannah, Barak, Deborah, Jephthah, Jephthah, Rebecca, Abigail, Ruth, Sarah, Leah, Rachel, Miriam, Esther, 15 New Testament men and women, Paul, Joanna, Susanna, Barnabas, Silas, Timothy, John the Baptist, Mary Magdalene, uh, Stephen, Jude, Titus, Mary, Zacchaeus, Zacharias, and Elizabeth. 
The text then mentioned in detail the doors, the door frames, and the windows. And before we get fully into that, let's just realize that no building in the Bible has ever paid so much attention to the windows. Um, in fact, the details are very, very important as what he was pointed out into the house of Lebanon. So at first, to me, they seemed a little random. But then as I dug, I was like, oh, I think these have purpose. <laughs> so windows, of course, are a part of the building's protective structure. They can be open and closed to provide temperature control, protection from weather or protection from the enemies. But they're also clear, which means inside of the house, you can see out and see very far. You can have hope or dreams or plans by looking out and down the road. They allow light into the house during the day while protecting enemies from seeing in. But at night in the dark, they allow the people outside to see anything going on inside if the light is on, much like us Christians, right? Now, the fact is they are square, which testifies to the fact of perfection. The fact that they are in three rows and three tiers and that they sit window opposite window allows us to understand that on both sides of the door, there are nine huge windows, quite enough light for everyone to have access to the light. The pattern of three rows and three tiers reminded me initially of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are three, but between them, they have nine characteristics, as you can see in this quick little graphic. Then as I was digging to make a model of this house that fit into the mathematical description, I quickly figured out that a 51 by 85 foot front with doors and windows in this pattern, it made perfect, it made a perfect balance to have a seven foot by seven foot window. That would be like perfection times perfection squared. So this is like super duper perfect windows. <laughs> now the doors do not have a ton of description. Only the only fact is that they were rectangles aligned with the windows and they had side light windows in three tiers. Now by reading about other buildings that Solomon did build, all done by his army and artisans, no slave will labor, by the way, um, we can take a fair guess that these doors were super impressive. Um, in some of the extra biblical literary, literary, literature that I waded through to learn about this building, I learned that the doors on the temple in Jerusalem were said to have automatic opening doors. That's pretty amazing for its time, don't you think? Please notice that on our building, we have three sets of windows, which gives us the idea that there are probably only three stories, even though the building is four stories high in our current culture. So I would think that the ceilings on each floor were extraordinarily high and regal. Now, when I was mocking up a little drawing of this building and I first made the door of this building, I was like, oh, look at that. It looks kind of like a cross right in the middle of the building. The doors, of course, are another part of the protective structure for a building, but they are also the main part calling people to come in or allowing people to leave. So doors symbolically represent a change of place, which if we're going to relate this to a post rapture place, it would be a change of place. Now let's yeah. dig into this building real quick on the front. Let's start in the middle at the doors and move out the door. Jesus is the door, the cross right in the center. John 10 9 says, Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and he will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is the light that bursts out of these windows. John 8 12 says, then Jesus spoke saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Trinity of the side lights, I am going to have the left long tall windows represent the Trinity's accomplishment in us and the right long Trinity of windows represent the Trinity's relationship with us. Consider these verses. Um, regarding accomplishment or to wash, sanctify or justify us. Second Corinthians 6 11, as such were some of you but you were washed and you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. Regarding the relationship, 
of the Trinity to us or the relationship with grace, love, and fellowship, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Now, when we zoom out and we look at the whole front of this building, it sort of reminds me of a Bible with the words on the left and the right, bringing the light and truth, and the door in the center where the pages will be bound together, also representing where Christ would be in the center of the story. Now, the Bible um, teaches, guides, and reveals. So, Proverbs 6.23, For the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light. Psalms 89.15, Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. Psalms 119.105, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. 2 Timothy 1.10, But has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to the light through the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 to 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose mind the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe. Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Here are a few other observations regarding the front in light of these verses. There's nine perfect squares of the windows. Perfect light of Christ by existing reveals the truth by exposing what darkness does hide. When we look windows on either side of the door, this causes the eye to move upward, which is to remind us to keep our focus on God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us. If we add up all the windows, 9 plus 6 plus 9, that's 24, which is the number of the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. Now, the last thing I'd like to point out about the light is that oil often represents the Holy Spirit in the Bible, but it is the same color as light, really. And in the, their times, oil was used to light up the homes in darkness. When I was researching this, I was surprised to learn that the common lamp that was used in Jesus' day had to be refilled with oil every 15 minutes or it would burn out. That put a whole new perspective for me on, on the parable of the wise virgins. Um, they would have to have had a lot of oil, first of all, and they would have to constantly be engaging with it in order to keep their lamps filled while they awaited their groom. So for us, that is like constantly praying, having your mind memorized in scripture, always musing over the things and the words of the scriptures and the Bible and trying to figure out the puzzles, trusting and following Christ's lead through the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, I think we take light for granted in our high-tech world. Everything's lit up, even the phone you're probably watching this on. But if you think back to Exodus 10, when the Egyptians had that plague of darkness, a darkness they could feel, or basically what life is like without God's light, which will happen again. Thankfully, we, um, we have Jesus, who in John 3.12, he calls himself the light of the world. And in a way, because... Christ is in us, we are also the light of the world, or the testimonies of Christ's love, truth, and goodness, according to Matthew 5 and Ephesians 5. Now, you'll notice in the initial perimeter of the chart of the house of the forest of Lebanon, compared with the other biblical buildings that I had placed in the original um, comparison, I did place the hall of pillars and the porch on there. Now, this is a point of controversy for some. Some believe especially those who believe that this building was in Jerusalem, they believe that the temple and other buildings were, these are all separate places. So they feel like the Hall of Pillars and the porch on the Hall of Pillars is a separate building than the House of the Forest of Lebanon. But I disagree with this because when I got and dug into the Hebrew, it does not say the Hall of Pillars, it says Ulam, which is actually a porch of pillars. And in the Hebrew, any time a porch is mentioned, it always refers to the building aforementioned. So because the porches are attached to buildings, they're not freestanding buildings. Therefore, this porch and the porch in front of it, those reflect, those are going to be connected to the house of the forest of Lebanon. So we have to add this porch or hall of pillars in front of the building 
and then a portico or a little porch in front of all of that, which is just a really wide covered porch, okay? So the Hall of Pillars was 85 feet wide. That's identical to the size of the front of the House of the Forest of Lebanon. And then in length, it comes out or comes forward 51 more feet. Um, the porch in front of that and the canopy in front of that, that size was not defined. I think it's just important to note that it does exist. So here's a rough visual of how, the, how majestic this would look. I mean, it would be very grand. Now going a bit backwards, there are the walls and the roof. And we know that above the interior pillars, it was lined with cedar paneling. And the Hebrew, it actually calls this paneling seifon, or covered with wainscoting. In our day, this would be similar to the ever popular shiplap. It means overlaid to hide or preserve. So the structure of the house, the walls and the roof remade is to hide or preserve the inhabitants. Much, I much like this definition. So here I have a few verses that point out the Lord God, Jehovah, the self-existing eternal God, Elohim, the one true God is our shiplap. If we can call him that, that seems a little disrespectful, but for the word picture, roll, roll with me. Anyway, he is our defense and he hides us. Psalm 125.2 points out that he surrounds his people. In Psalm 91.2, it shows that he is our refuge and our fortress. In Second Chronicles 14.9, it points out that the walls are given to us for rest. And Psalm 9, 9 reminds us that the Lord is a refuge. The walls being made of cedar, again, point back to the majesty and the purity of the building. Now, a similar finding um, can be found for the roof, which is also, or the ceiling that is made of cedar. Mm. Protection and structure are provided by Jehovah Elohim, the Lord God. Psalm 91 4 says he shall cover you with his feathers like a roof. Okay, now I know this has been a lot of details about this building, but here's where we start pulling it all together. Um, the House of the Forest of Lebanon, after researching it, it seemed an awful lot like this country seat of Solomon the king, like Camp David and Norad all rolled into one. You see, the northern border of Israel and Lebanon, um, that's where this building would have been. So the, this was the first citadel built for Israel. Um, this building was built to take assaults. It was built to be a first line of defense against the temple and the governing centers. Um, it was a needed citadel because Assyria, their greatest threat at Solomon's time, was also on that northern border. And in the middle of the vast wilderness of trees, the forest still exists, but it's much smaller due to harvesting and wars. The forest that exists now is an actual preserve, um, an international park, and it is called Eden. <laughs> Eden. <laughs> and the trees they most pride there are the Lebanon cedar tree. They call them the cedars of God. So, this building was filled with shields and golden vessels at the least. More things might have been there, but that is what's mentioned, which seems random, but I don't think it is. So, the Hall of Pillars is like a museum for past soldiers in a way. In many kingdoms, um, they have the, these halls of pillars filled with armor, historical records, cultural stories, especially of notable soldiers, wars, and tools of war. Um, and it was also impressively bold and beautiful, and I would imagine it would be quite a refreshing sight to see if you were walking through the wilderness or the forest, and all of a sudden there's this huge, gigantic building surrounded by trees. A safe place, a place to retreat and rest or fight battles if needed. Now, what about the wilderness that it is in? In a wilderness, a wilderness, a wilderness can be positive or negative thing, depending on the perspective. For this, I'm going to mostly focus on the positive because I believe that is the intent for this place. Quiet, tranquil, undisturbed, serene, peaceful, calm, restful, desolate, empty, the place for animals to graze. 
filled with strong trees that can grow independently when needed. An entire ecosystem is in balance in the wilderness without conflict, the way God intended things to be. Being in nature in peace allows us for undistracted connection to God. Okay, now we're going to skip back and look at the Hall of Pillars a little bit. This was filled, a filled armory. We know this because of the other verse that told us there were 200 bucklers and 300 shields. So here's a visual to grasp how many 200 bucklers would look like. Note that in ancient warfare, these would not be made of gold typically, but of something more absorbent. And the soldiers would soak them in water so that if fiery arrows were shot at them, it would put them out, extinguish them when they hit. Um, they also would be used in groups where together as a team, all would be surrounded and protected head to toe. Gold clearly is symbolic of the wealth of this kingdom, but it was still bothering me that the gold shields would not be really practical in war. And this was an actual citadel. Solid pure gold is actually kind of soft. Um, which is why most of us with jewelry don't have 24 karat gold. But I learned that actual pure gold has other properties of interest, like healing. Um, but a shield, I found that gold melts at 1,947 degrees. If you look at a fiery arrow, which is typically made of wood, the temperature of wood burns between 900 and 1,200 degrees. So the gold would be highly efficient against um, fiery arrows. Gold is also used in, a highly, in high efficiency solar cells, which made me think of gathering God's energy or being able to defend the enemy with God's power, which is the very definition of the shield of faith, right? We're not using our power to fight in a spiritual battle. We're always using God's power. We're just tapping in and reflecting it to the enemy. Um, for you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. You will surround him with a shield, Psalm 512. As far as the 300 gold shields go, um, the definition for this is more of a handheld shield that allows for more freedom of movement in warfare. So here's a visual of 300 gold shields. Now again, Ephesians reminds us that the shield is made up of faith. This is what wipes out Satan's darts. And I believe the world has programmed us um, through media to think that the end times is going to be some physical bloody war between the powers of good and evil. My gut says this is going to be a huge spiritual war. And those who have mastered the art of faith and have learned to defend themselves with the scripture and allow Christ to work in their behalf and, and trust God to take care of things, not to operate under fear. I think these would be the ones that will don the shield of faith because they are very practiced at it. Um, for our shield belongs to the Lord and our King, the Holy One of Israel, Psalm 89, 18. Now it's also interesting to note the value of these shields. Um, 300 shields, when I converted everything from um, the measurements they had in the Bible, the 300 larger shields would be about 15 pounds of gold and the 200 shields would be about three pounds of gold. Um, if you're talking about today's value, it's $1,899 per pound right now, today, for the value of gold. So that's $30,384 times three for the small one, which is $91,152 for one shield. <laughs> and then for the larger shield, $182,304 for one shield. <laughs> anyway, per shield. So if we added up all of these shields together and their current market value of gold, we come up to $63,806,400 just in shields alone. Now, do I think that God cares about our money or our money system? No. What I think is this shows how wealthy because God owns everything. 
everything here is God's, everything on this earth. And would he not for his servants have something so nice? Of course he would. But we are the king's kids. So of course we're going to be in luxury, whether we have pre-considered that or not. And before this study, I really hadn't thought about it because I'm just getting through today. I'm not really, you know, always focused on, oh, well, what's it going to be like when I'm in heaven? You know, like I don't really think about that that often. So what I did learn, though, is that David, he took one of his um, servant's shields and it was taken from it was taken from a different army and it was from one of the servants. And in the ancient days, the servants of very fancy, you know, kingdoms, they would have gold shields. And you know what those gold shields were for? Looks. They would take these gold shields and it meant that they trusted that the king and the king's army would protect them because they knew the gold shield was just ornamental. So that made me think, okay, this whole thing is about is about reflecting God's power. And when you think of pure gold, especially in daytime, like let's say the bright of day and, and let's say that daytime is when the battle is, you could use those almost as mirrors to bounce light onto the enemy. We're fighting the entire team, Satan, team Satan. They don't like light. So what we're basically able to do is with faith, take God's light and bounce it onto the enemy. This is pretty cool. <laughs> Doesn't matter if this is real or if this is metaphorical. This is pretty cool. Now we talked about um, King Solomon's drinking vessels being stored and that everything, all the vessels at the house of the forest of Lebanon are pure gold. We don't know if all those vessels are forks and knives and everything else. We do know they mentioned drinking vessels, and so I'm going to run with that, okay? Now, gold obviously screams of luxury, triumph, celebration, perfection, value, purity, wrath, etc. I think that the fact that the cups were so focused on in Scripture is very significant. First, we know that Jesus told his disciples, But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom, Matthew 26, 29 and we to regularly take from the communion cup in Christ's remembrance. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, The cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, 1 Corinthians 11.25. So for us, it could be a reminder of our promise of Christ. But I think there's a deeper level to this. Um, looking at what happened to Solomon's drinking vessels after the Jews were taken into Babylonian captivity, I think, and matching that up with Revelation, I think gives us a huge clue to what's going on and why this is recorded this way. So if you remember Belshazzar, Daniel 5, 1, Belshazzar, the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords. Daniel 5, 3, then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God. Then, Daniel 5.23, who have lifted up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his home before you, and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your way, you have not glorified. So obviously these stolen cups were some pride of the conquester, Belshazzar. And obviously God reacted violently regarding this since the, con since the consequence, if you go back and read this famous writing, this was the, this was the story with many, many tekel aparzin on the wall, the writing on the wall. And it, the translation was, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And that night the king was killed. I mean, this was like a serious crime to take the drinking vessels out of the house of the Lord. 
Um, so then they were just parting with him with pagans and unholy people and worshiping their fake gods. So obviously not honoring God and using his pure vessels is a problem for God. Revelation 17, 4. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. The woman clearly um, feels that she has conquered and she is celebrating with the blood of the saints. Again, same theme, right? And again, she bears this golden cup filled with abominations. In the Greek, it is um, delugma, which means a detestable thing, um, especially of idols or idol worship. And it's used predictably in the Bible six times. <laughs> so Luke, 15, Luke 16, 15 explains this. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. It is also used of the abomination of desolation from Daniel. It's used by Jesus in Matthew 24, which was referring to the ritual pig sacrifice before the pagans would take over a city. And then they would commit that city to their pagan gods, especially Baal, Ishtar, Hel, or Mars, Venus, and Jupiter, depending on how you want to look at it. Now, I could go on forever with those names because in every culture and in every generation, they've renamed them, like rebranded. Oh, yay, we got new names, but you know, it's not cool. So if the cups in the house of the forest in Le of Lebanon seem to make a statement to me about the purity, the focus on the one true God and the selfless nature of those allowed to partake in this building. Those that are washed by the blood of Christ and seen as pure in God's eyes without blemish, without one foot in the world, purely his. The celebration that will occur when the darkness, Antichrist and Satan are finally bound and all of heaven will rejoice and celebrate over this. Um, much like the proper and reverse story of what happened with Belshazzar. When they conquered Israel, it'll be much the opposite. That we will all celebrate because we finally conquered Satan and darkness. Now, could this be our wilderness? That's the question. Now, after my cabin dream, I could not stop thinking about this cabin. Why? I mean, it was, you know, I was, I can always recall all of my dreams that are very significant, but this cabin was, was egging on me. Like it was on, it was on my mind constantly. And after studying this, I can see some very distinct parallels between the house of the forest of Lebanon and the bride of Christ or the church. Okay. Okay. So that this ends part one the structure and the building of the house of the forest of Lebanon. The application is so long that we need to break this into two pieces, but um, it's going to be worth it. Hang in there. Please watch part two. <laughs>